I think it's time we ask ourselves if we still know the freedoms that were intended for us by the founding fathers. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. Hey guys, welcome back to the Libertopian Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Mitchell, and uh, like I promised, uh, I will be doing in this most of this podcast about the healthcare decision. And if you remember correctly, last week I said I'm going to go ahead and give you my prediction, and then I will, I'll bring this podcast back up after my prediction comes true. And what was my prediction again? That they would uphold the entire law. That's exactly what I said would happen. And it's not exactly the way I said it, because I basically said that they would uphold the entire law, and then they would just say, look, the president has the right to give waivers, They didn't really comment on that at all, although that right by the president still stands for him to be able to give waivers. But they did do a few things with um, the Commerce Clause and redefining it. So it's kind of complicated, and there's some people who are saying, oh, Justice Roberts is a genius, or Justice Roberts is an idiot. Uh, I lean on the idiot side of that, that debate. Uh, but we've got uh, our good friend Chris Smithson on with us this week as well, and we're going to get his take on it. Chris, how's it going, man? It's going great. Looking forward to talking about this awesome new health care law that is now ruled constitutional by five out of nine judges. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, they really showed some insight on interpreting the Constitution, didn't they? Yes, it was, it was overwhelmingly constitutional. Five out of nine. So uh, that's a huge majority of the vote, and uh, it's good to know that uh, things can be passed in our country and then ruled constitutional by a slim majority like that of uh, justices who may or may not have a good understanding of the Constitution. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely true that uh, – well, I mean, it, we, we know that it's it's been this way for a long time, obviously, but it just was uh, – and you know what, what's also interesting to me is how – the left on this issue is basically saying, cause, because, for instance, uh, Rand Paul came out and said, look, I don't care if they ruled it constitutional. It's still unconstitutional. It doesn't change right. the fact that the bill's unconstitutional. And the right. left's like, oh, how ignorant can you be? Once the <laughs> court rules it constitutional, it's obviously constitutional. So right. if the Supreme Court came out and said, slavery is now constitutional, concentration camps are constitutional, uh, well, illegal wiretapping. I could say that, but they already do that. So I'm trying to think of something ridiculous. What's something ridiculous, Chris, that they could say is constitutional that would just be so ridiculous? Um, murder? Yeah, yeah. Murder is uh, constitutional, so therefore murder's good. And and then the left would say, how can you say murder is not constitutional? The Supreme <laughs> Court did... The edict from on high by the oligarchy on the Supreme Court, they dictate what is you know, right, what is true, what is constitutional. And that's what Thomas Jefferson said. He said, if the last vestige of liberty rests with you know, the justices on the Supreme Court, then we're ruled by an oligarchy. He said, right. really, the last vestige is the states. So you know, I guess my prescription at this point in time is you know, there's states out there that can still opt out of this. I would opt out of it. I would rebel against it. I would say we're not implementing it in our state. And some of some of the states are doing that to some degree. I know Louisiana and Bobby Jindal, basically Bobby said, I'm not going to start implementing it. And, uh, huh. and I'm not sure, you know, what his thinking is on it, but he's going to capitulate. Even if he's like, I'm not going to implement it because it's not good for the state. He's, uh, he's going to end up capitulating because, I, to my knowledge, someone told me that the Supreme Court also said that basically you cannot penalize the states for opting out of it. Because they yes, were, they were, say that. They're gonna, they were going to pull your Medicare funding or Medicaid yes. funding and stuff. And they said you right. can't do that. So hopefully this will open up the door for a host of states to say, look, we're not going to be a part of this. And But at the same time, you have to think about how political everything is, you know, it's not based off a of principle. So, you know, Bobby Jindal might say, look, I, it might be the right thing to do. And I know a lot of my constituents want to have or want to be out of Obamacare, but it would cost so much political capital 
for me to do that, and it's just not worth it. Well, let's talk about what Obamacare really is. Uh, you know, everyone says it's universal health care, but from my understanding, it's really not universal health care, is it? No, uh, I would say that essentially what it is is a instead of more of a universal healthcare system, which would be more you know communistic, it's more of a fascist type system where essentially you they they brought the insurance companies in and said, okay, help us compose of a bill that would help you profit, but at the same time get more people covered. And so a lot of socialists are saying, look, yeah, we know that you know the big insurance companies are going to make a lot of money off of this, but more people will get covered by it, so it's a good thing. That's that's the way that they're thinking of it. Versus the principal, you know, libertarian will say, well, hold on a second, we shouldn't have all this collusion between the insurance companies and the government in the first place, right? And we, you know, yeah, they, a lot of the insurance companies. That's why, if you look at after the ruling passed, all the uh, the stocks for the insurance sector just skyrocketed because now. There's a mandate out there that that mandates that people get health insurance. So that's like right. saying we're going to definitely increase your demand by 50 million people or something like that. And so people are like, oh crap, let's flood in. You know, it's just the market knows what's going on here. And right. well, my question is, the original goal was to make sure that no one in America. This was, you know, the, the noble goal of of the people that. I mean, I'm not going to label them. I'm just going to leave them as the people that wanted. You know, everyone to have access to health care. Noble goal was that everyone have access to health care. So by passing Obamacare, does it cover everyone in the United States? Do if if I can't afford health care, am I granted health care? If you if you are below a that's another thing from government is they typically, you know, throw down edicts about if you're below this income level then health care will be subsidized and provided to you. Well, what if I'm like a dollar over that income level? But I'm not going to even get into that. That's just their ridiculousness. Well, but my question is, does it – because I read – I saw a guy say no. It, if you can't afford it to buy it, it just – what I basically read is that it just basically mandates that everybody must buy into some type of health care. And if they do not, they are penalized if they can't afford to do so. And choose not to. They are penalized if they cannot afford to do so. They are not penalized. Are those people who cannot afford to do so? Are they subsidized and granted health care anyway? Uh, to my knowledge, they are. I mean, I think that if you are below that income and you choose not to get health care, they will not. They will not tax you for it like they would someone who is above it. But if you're below that income level and you want health care then what they're going to end up doing is they're going to have these pools. They're going to pull together. Insur It'll basically be like a government program. And then you'll go to the government and say, look, I can't afford health care. And then using that pool, they'll subsidize your health care to, to the lowest possible level of cheapness to where you can possibly afford it or might even cover it all together. I could be wrong about that, but uh, to my knowledge, that was the whole intent of it was to try to get those – 50 million people access to care, and uh, right. uh, if a lot of those people can't afford it, then it's going to have to be provided for them underneath the law, I would imagine. So if not, it and, and, and the idea is for the insurance companies to be able to offer those lower rates or zero rates to people who can't afford it, they need everybody else who can't afford it to have it. So they have to, you know, out of the 50 million people who don't have insurance, if 20 million of those people actually can't afford it and just decided not to have it, those people have to have it and pay the full price for it so that we it's a, it's redistribution of wealth in, in a sense because you're taking from people who are going to pay higher premiums for health care or pay a higher premium for health care just so you can subsidize people who cannot afford health care is basically what the way that I read it. Okay, well, just from reading uh, an article on Forbes – uh, about uh, basically, it's it's titled "The Big Problem with Obama Healthcare." Obamacare is it doesn't help many, and um, <clears throat> basically, uh, Samuel Alito, you know, he's a Supreme Court justice. Uh, he pointed out that the typical 27-year-old 
could be much worse off under Obamacare because uh, they may consume on average, they or they do consume on average, less than $900 a year in health care services, but <clears throat> will be required to spend more than five times that much to buy an insurance policy. With So apparently you have to buy a certain type of policy with many bells and whistles like low deductibles and pediatric care that most young consumers don't need. And then uh, Alito goes on to, to quote, isn't it the case that what this mandate really do is doing is not requiring people who are is not requiring the people who are subject to it to pay for the services that they are going to consume. So uh, it is requiring them to subsidize services that will be received by somebody else. So if everybody pays the same amount for things they don't need, like just like if let's say you go to you know McDonald's and you don't always buy the value meal, but suddenly McDonald's requires you buy the value meal, you know. You're, even though you don't want it, you're subsidizing everybody else's value. You're making it cheaper for McDonald's to produce that's value. Correct. So that's what Alito said. Yeah. And and uh, basically the article goes on to say is that Obamacare is designed to address a relatively small amount of the population, which according to the government's own briefs in support of the law, is something like $43 billion in medical expenses that hospitals and providers recover by charging all of us that have insurance more. And that unpaid tab, the government says, increases the average family insurance premium by $1,000 a year. And that's it. The fundamental reason for health care reform, according to the government itself, is to fix a problem that each year costs about as much as five nuclear submarines or a year's worth of federal highway expenditures. So we passed a gigantic, far-reaching, multi-year implementing market changing bill and we could have just covered that 43 billion dollars by cutting a few things somewhere else yeah and, and uh but but being able to you know cutting things from somewhere else i mean <laughs> i mean we don't want to do that i mean we don't want to cut things from somewhere else but you know I, I think nick gillespie from reason magazine said it best he was on bill maher's show this past week and um he's a comedian right uh, well, he's more—he's just an editor, but I mean, he'll 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 comment on a, a wide variety of social issues, and he is somewhat funny from time to time. But he's not really a comedian, I would say. Or are you talking about Bill Maher? No, no, no. I know Bill Maher's a, yeah, he yeah. tries to be a comedian. Yeah, he tries to be funny, but uh, he's really not. Um, but Nick Gillespie was on there with uh, Mr. Maddow—I mean Rachel Maddow from uh, from uh, MSNBC, and. Uh, they were arguing about health care, and Nick Gillespie made a astute point. He said, basically, this does what most entitlements have always done. It takes from the relatively young and relatively poor, and it gives to the relatively old and relatively rich. So the older, it's, it's basically young people, aside from the, the, you know, unless you're just 21 years old and you're morbidly obese and you have diabetes, already, already have diabetes and all these health problems, which I understand can be an issue, but on a statistical basis, most people who are in horrible health and are having issues with the healthcare system are people over the age of 40 who have more money than, let's say, a 25-year-old on average. Yet, because they have all these health issues, you know, healthcare costs are going up. They're the ones pushing healthcare costs up, not the 25-year-old, but now the 25-year-old is forced into a system of buying insurance to subsidize those people who are older, who are sickly, and are, you know to, to, to try to offset their premium cost. Here's my question that I, you know, want to ask opponents of the healthcare bill is: Who do you know that has died because they couldn't get medical care? Personally. Who do you know? Who do you know that knows someone that has died? Because they couldn't, just couldn't afford medical care. Just couldn't afford it. They died. How many people do you really know that that happened to? How many people have you heard of that that has happened to? I would probably, I'll probably not, not probably, I'll def, I would definitely risk saying that no one you can speak to knows anyone who ever died because they couldn't afford medical care that was suggested to them by a medical professional. Mm -mm. So, what do we really do? 
I think, you know, and this basically is a, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to this. A lot of times I ask questions I already have a, you know, an answer for in my head to to make other people think. But at the same time, uh, other people do that to me. But I really am asking this question: Where did, where did the, where did we get the need for this bill, this law from? What happened that spurred people to think we needed universal health care? Because I don't, I've never heard of anybody. I don't know anybody other than people who use it as a, you know, a theory or, or a suggestion, an argument. Oh, well, you know, then if we don't do this, we're going to have people in hospitals, you know, dying or in the streets dying because they, they can't get health care. They can't afford it. And that seems to me to be not the case. I mean, th there's already a law that says a hospital can't refuse you service. You know, they have to basically eat it. If you come in and need emergency health care or, or whatever, you know, yeah. they, have to take, they have to take care of you. So They have to tell so, you. So, so my question is, where is all this coming from? And so from the same article, uh, it says that even the even the uninsured that we trumped up as, oh, there's this, this many people that don't have health insurance, so we need to pass this law, is way too low. The conservative Cato Institute says the number of uninsured is too high. However, because 25% of the uninsured are eligible for Medicaid or the state children's health insurance program for families below 200% of the poverty line. So that's a huge chunk right there. Cato says 64% of uninsured children are eligible for SCHIP. Another 10 million uninsured aren't citizens. We counted them among the people that need to be insured. Oh, yeah. They're not citizens. Yeah. And this paper, now there's a paper by ec economists Kate Berndorf and Mark Pauly suggest between 25 and 75 percent of the uninsured have incomes high enough to afford health insurance, but choose not to. Many are young and healthy and don't perceive the need for it. An existing state and federal law covers virtually everybody else. $43 billion is the cost cited by the administration, for example, but it doesn't include the $30 billion that Medicaid pays hospitals under so-called disproportionate share programs designed to help out hospitals with a high percentage of low-income patients. So that's 30 of the $43 billion that we were trying to take care of with this law has already covered. And the law providing for that money it was passed back in 1985. It also doesn't include the care provided to the truly poor under Medicaid, which is $366 billion in 2009 which is according to the Kaiser Foundation, or Medicare, which cost an estimated $525 billion a year, which was passed in 1965 and covers 38 million retirees. So who are we, who are we helping? Who is not insured? Who isn't covered? And I'm not saying these programs we have in place are good because most of them are wasteful and bad anyway. Right, they they can be attributed for driving up the cost that sure. we have now. So, yeah. But if you want if you want health care for poor people, you already have it in a lot of different forms. So, let's take out the ten percent that are that are illegals, and you've got your you've got your extra ten billion dollars that you need to be covered. So, it, that's just a question I ask. What, what, why do we do it? But but secondly. You know, Chad, you and I, I'm sure, I know I do, and, and I'm pretty sure you do. You, we run into, I ran into someone on you know, Facebook who says, you know, if you don't, you know, all these people say, if you don't want health care, universal health care, what do you want? Like, are you a monster? Like, don't you not, you know, why don't you, this is a right people have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like you, if you can remember, you know, there was a discussion you had recently with a friend of ours on Facebook, and, and you asked him two questions about rights. And he answered both of them in the positive, and, and then basically you had them because the you either have the right to one or the right to to, to neither because one mm -hmm. requires force by government. Yeah, well, and, and I, I remember that question, and this goes back to the heart of it for me. And there was another guy who commented on that same posting because I took a moral argument, right. and he said we don't need to talk about morals. This is just an overreach of government. And I said, dude, I understand where you're coming from. Believe me, I argue just for the overreach and the unconstitutional nature, but I feel that if we're going to move anywhere, we have to show the people how logically contradictory their statements are and how, right. how contradictory it is 
whenever you say you have a right to health care, but you also have a right to private ownership. Or it's moral for someone to have health care by force, but it's also moral for someone to own property. Well, right. those those are those contradict one another, so they cannot logically stand. So, you know, there was a guy on another posting that I'm sure you probably didn't see, but when I was arguing with him and, you know, I took moral arguments, this is basically his response to one of the things that I said, and I can't remember exactly uh, what my comment beforehand was, but I'm sure you can gather it by what his response was. He said, and you don't think having a doctor can help prevent serious ish issues? L I did see that. Yeah. LOL, seriously, misguided? Why should we let people die in the street? What kind of selfish person are you? And so, you know, I said, look, I said, I said, number one, doctors are not gods. If you look at doctors, they are awesome at preventing infectious disease and things like that. And if you get a broken, if you break your arm, they're great for it. But doctors in medical school take one class on nutrition, one class. I said, I said, if you want to, if you want to talk about nutrition and taking care of your body and really preventing things, and if you want to talk about increasing health in this country, you don't give everybody insurance to go to a medical doctor. They aren't the best people for that anyway. I said, they're not going to say, hey, by the way, these are some good supplements that you might want to be on. You're not getting all the the nutrition from your food and what you, you know, all that stuff. They're not going to say any of that. They're going to say, man, for whatever reason, you have this degenerative disease that you probably have because you haven't been eating correctly or getting the vitamins and minerals that you need. But here, take this. Here, take this. Take this pill. The FDA says it's good for you. They don't have a clue, and and, and so they they only know one solution, which is a a a uh, a uh, drug solution. That's the only a solution. Pill. That, uh, the, the pill. pill for yeah. Uh, for a surgery. Yeah, exactly. Those are the solutions that they know, and so if you want to talk about health. You know, number one, we need to talk about the moral uh, argument for health care, which is if we are a, a compassionate country, a, a compassionate society, it's made up of individuals who have empathy for their other human for other human beings in the society, then we don't need force to make sure people are taken care of. Ron Paul is a perfect example of that. That guy came in with his wife. They couldn't get care because he was black and his wife was white. And Ron Paul stepped in. Helped them out. She had a you know a stillborn baby, which is very sad. But Ron Paul looked at the guy and said, "Don't worry about the bill. I'm going to take care of it for you, right?" And so doctors used to do that on a regular basis because that's what being a doctor was. You know, whenever you went to medical school, you you took your you know your oath and all that stuff. And part of that was not refusing care to someone who was truly in need. And doctors used to do that. It's like that stupid, silly movie. Uh, uh, John Q. You remember that movie John Q. Yeah. That they, yeah, yeah, yeah. With Denzel Washington that they used to try to push universal health care because because that's what all that movie was about was Hollywood. He, he couldn't afford to yeah. get the the heart. Yeah, the ha heart transplant wasn't covered by his HMO for his son. For his son, and um, basically he tried the charity route. His church and everything raised up a bunch of money. It still wasn't enough money. And so he took over the hospital and tried to force the doctor, who was a selfish asshole, to, to right. work on his son and do the operation. Because they had the heart, but they wouldn't do the operation. Well, he was going to give his heart. Oh, yeah, that's right. He was going to give his heart. But, 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 but appar apparently, I think in that movie, you couldn't just give your heart to somebody. I don't know if that was the case. I thought the, the, the whole case of it was that uh, the doctor... Because he would die. You can't just give your heart to somebody. Yeah, yeah. That, I think there. I think there's laws against that. So that's that's government stepping in where they shouldn't be stepping in because which people, is government problem, yeah. not the insurance yeah. problem. But no, I mean, you know, he basically made the case in that movie that doctors are selfish assholes. That if someone is truly in, nobody takes pro bonos. No one does things like that. Doctors are just selfish pricks. And don't get me wrong, there are some doctors that are like that nowadays. But you know why they're like that? They're like that because state power has taken so much power away from society as a whole that people do not feel, feel compelled to help their fellow man. It's like, well, there's government. They're, they take my tax money. They can help you. you know. But if, if we knew as a society, if me and you knew, look, there's no government programs. There are some people who are in need. 
you know, if I knew of a charity or something that I could donate to to help those types of people, and I knew the charity was responsible and making sure that they're not drug addicts and people who are, you know, people who are really trying to better themselves but just are on hard luck, I would help them out. But you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to do that if the government's already taxing the shit out of me to pay for that. And the reality is, is, you know, they're not nearly as efficient. You know, I mean, if you look at, and I hate making the efficiency argument because I think the moral argument is more compelling for, it's more compelling for changing people's minds. But still, the reality is a private charity is way more efficient at helping people sure. than government. Right. So I think the moral argument, like, yeah. It's, it, it's so, it just blows my mind that I even have these conversations with people and I say, Really, you think that the government is going to make healthcare more or cheaper, more cost efficient? Well, that goes against you know. If you say that, you haven't logically thought, you haven't applied your mind logically to what you're saying, because it's like any project. Let's say that your driveway is is jacked up and you need to pour concrete and fix it. Now. Is it going to be more cost efficient and, and is it going to get done faster if I go and buy the concrete and do it myself or if I have the government do it, which will involve con a contractor, uh, contracts between people of employment, um, bids for the concrete itself. Uh, if they, if they use, you know, if they, well, they'll have to buy it from somebody. So yeah, they'll try to find, you know, bids to get the concrete itself and that'll take time, which also is money because people have to be paid to do that. And you get into the whole bureaucracy of any process the government does. So let's blow that up to a macroeconomic scale. What is cheaper? The market, which is the people, the doctors who provide healthcare, uh, providing it to, to me, let's not even talk about insurance, just providing it directly to me. Um, is that more cost efficient on a consumer provider basis, or is it going to be more cost efficient if we involve the government who has to create a huge bureaucracy to administer it? It is not logical to say that any government program will make anything cheaper ever, ever, ever. That includes anything you can think of. And I had a recent discussion with a guy on a different forum who said, oh, government's never made anything cheaper. Well, find me a private uh, service that can send a letter for cheaper than the post office, which I'm not even, I'll get back to that in a minute. You should probably laugh your ass off and kill yourself if you believe that that's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who, who pays for your roads and water? You try to buy water. Okay, don't be an idiot. D don't be an idiot. It, it blows my mind that people think this stuff and it enrages me. Be fucking honest with yourself for once the post office is operating at a gigantic loss every year to stay competitive with private enterprise they can't compete because they pay way too much for people to work for them and they pay way too much for their supplies because it's a government bureaucracy they are in debt well and so yeah and so yeah they may be cheaper than ups or fedex but they're also not that much cheaper they're slower, less efficient, and they operate at a loss. Yeah. At a loss. Yeah. And and your roads and interstates, yeah, they're great. Our roads and interstates are awesome. No, they're not. You can drive down one and your tire explodes because there's a hole in it. Yeah, the quality. The quality is shit. They're shitty. Yeah. So and and you can't even get into the loss probably behind that mm. or or your water well, no. or the debt or, or or the debt we accrue, you know rendering these services to people yeah. so when you when you make an argument for universal health care or, or obamacare which is a bastardized form of it and you say this is gonna make health care so much more efficient and and cost you know cost effective and affordable no it isn't it's gonna make it more expensive because that's what government does it doesn't know how to make things more efficient because for government to get involved with something it has to involve so many things to get anything done that, that you don't that you don't expect. And an example that I love, I love when people use it is with uh, with med with medicine. It's, it's so pertinent. Is LASIK eye surgery, right? Mm -hmm. LASIK eye surgery came out not that long ago, and people went crazy for it because you don't have to wear glasses. 
makes your eyesight 2020 basically right and so when it first came out it was pretty expensive and not many doctors did it well it wasn't covered by insurance it's still not covered by insurance so what happened with lasik eye surgery just like breast augmentation uh it became better because people started realizing there was a profit to be made in it doctors did so they tried to make themselves better at it they develop better tools for it and they compete against each other and the price of LASIK has gone down ridiculously because insurance doesn't pay for it and they know they have to make it affordable to the average Joe on the street so now doctors will give you their phone number their home you know their email address or whatever and say yeah I, you know, I want to be your LASIK eye doctor because there's so much competition you know what I mean oh yeah and so that itself made it affordable yeah well but but I, I, I digress because my whole question that I want to answer today or at least pose today to people who listen to the podcast is why government? It's it's a noble it's a noble idea to say that everyone should be able to access health care. And as I as I provided earlier with that article from Forbes, most people are, even though we want to say that they aren't. People are dying in the streets with you've never seen and by you i mean anyone who ever listens to this podcast has never seen someone die in the street because they couldn't get health care but why government and uh i recently there was a a girl that i'm friends with and she she was you know uh, touting the supreme court ruling on facebook and saying it's awesome and mm -hmm. and then i i made a comment about how um you know i say voluntary assistance over compulsory social contracts any day this will have repercussions we cannot yet fathom, as any law does. Any law you make has repercussions that you don't realize because it affects parts of society so diverse that it's going to affect things you didn't see. So she came back with uh, the three different types of people that she's seen argue against health care, which none of them are me, but they're all you know your typical left-leaning um, type of person likes to – you know that it was three different uh, – Say stereotypes of people, you know, that they all say argue against healthcare. Right. And then even our history teacher got into it. And I'll actually read his part because it's so ridiculous. But uh, he said, Next time somebody tells you how the federal government is too powerful and all that other BS, this guy's a history teacher, which go, goes to show you as well that things you're taught in school are taught by human beings who already have a bias. Either biased of their own because of their own personal views or whatever, or they're biased because they were taught by someone else who was biased. Right. So he's a history teacher who taught her. Uh, so and next time somebody tells you how the federal government is too powerful and all that other BS, ask them to name just one country in the history of the world that was successful with a weak central government. Ask them to look up the term liberum veto, which is what the Tea Party nutbag Republicans, publicants, seem to want for the U.S. and ask them how that turned out for Poland in the 18th century. The problem with most of these people is they know absolutely nothing about history, said the history instructor. He put that in parentheses, <laughs> said the history instructor. Now, I'm glad you're laughing because I laugh too. That scares the shit out of me that this guy is teaching history. Yeah. Really. So I'm just going to read what I posted back to her. And uh, this may go over. Well, I can, it's not that long. And I'm gonna I'm gonna read what I and he was included in the in the uh, in the response. So here we go. And and I'll let you talk after this because I've been on the long rant. Okay, so here's my response to that and to her saying, you know, people that people that don't like healthcare, they they can't give a you know they, they don't have logical arguments. It's all emotional. Here's what I said. My question is why government? Why does government? What does government do other than war efficiently? And even war is debatable. Government ultimately is force. When you legislate something into law, you are saying you will do this or force will be used against you to do it. That's not morality. That's bullshit. Then I quoted Pendulette, which if you want to look up the quote from Pendulette, you can just uh, type in. It's amazing to me how many people in Google and you can see what he said about everything. But basically he says, voting our government to use guns to give money to help poor and suffering people is immoral, self-righteous, bullying laziness. Uh, and so I'm going to skip that part. But then I said, how's government working out for us so far? It's been involved in health care for a very long time, not just recently. Since that involvement, the cost of health care has skyrocketed. How's the government involvement in education working out for us at both the state and federal level? Good graduation rates? No. Good literacy rates? No. Lower cost of education? No. It goes up by a ridiculous amount year after year, and we have students in debt to the tune of one trillion dollars how is all that taxing going 
We have a surplus and are out of debt, right? No. $15 trillion in reported debt. How's our monetary policy going? Oh, that's right. Rapid inflation, devaluation, decreased buying, and economic power globally. How's the war on drugs going? Money well spent, right? All this leads you to believe that even more government is the solution? And to the history teacher, surely you would agree that if history should have taught us anything, it's that free societies eventually degrade into dictatorships time after time. A nation becomes an empire. The people rely on it or those in power to take care of them and make choices for them, and eventually it all collapses. Government is fallible because it is run by humans. The more power you grant it, the larger the mistakes it makes can be. Eventually it becomes corrupt because that is what power does. And when a government becomes corrupt, the more powerful it is, the more harmful it can be. So again, instead of us lazily saying that government should take care of the people by force, which can have, as it has in the past, results that were not intended, why can we not look at other avenues, like people personally choosing to take care of other people? I think the assumption a lot of people make when I and others speak out against forced government programs is that just because we don't think government should do it, we also think it shouldn't be done at all. That's the furthest thing from the truth. We started with a weaker federal government than we have now. Countries do not begin with huge, powerful central governments. That's how they end. Yeah, and, and, and that's an excellent point. And, you know, that, that you're right. It is scary that there's such a bias in the history that is sim that is taught typically. And, and it typically gets fostered in, an, in, in liberal, liberal universities where they basically all – there's no genuine research. There's no gener general or genuine, I should say, uh, look at the real history, look at the real documents, and look at the actual, you know – the different things that actually took place, if it doesn't coincide with the liberal idea of a strong uh, central government, then they just they discount it. And because everything is peer review and they all agree, nothing ever changes from that. But, you know, I would like to point out, I don't know where this guy got his uh, degree degree from. Uh, he might be a history teacher, but you, do you understand that you actually do not have to have a degree? Is he a high school teacher or a college professor? I'm going to say I'm going to say he's probably high school. So if he's a high school history teacher, you don't need a degree in history for that. Right. You don't. I There was plenty of that. Now, I had a high school history teacher that had a master's degree in history. She was very smart. She had a little bit of a liberal bias, but she didn't know the history for the most part. There were some history teachers that just taught from the book and didn't know anything. So basically what he's doing is saying, because I'm a history teacher, I'm an authority on the argument. But the reality is we don't really know if he's an authority. You know, I would rather defer to someone like Tom Woods, who has a bachelor's degree from Harvard in history and a Ph.D. from Columbia University. And he probably would laugh in that guy's face because the guy doesn't have a clue about what he's talking about. And right. Tom obviously knows history. So, you know, I would th I would think that for Tom to go through all that history and come out saying, you know, the things that he currently says knowing that the history is wrong would make him completely corrupt. And I just don't see Tom Woods as being that way. But I think it, it still goes back to the moral argument. And I think this is where you make people, you, you have people give pause, right? If we could take a time machine, time machine, back to 1830, 1840, sort of the beginning of the uh, abolitionist movement, right? Right. The same arguments that people could make that this guy made. What did this guy say again? He said that no no country has survived without a strong central government. Is that what he said? Uh, he basically said, uh, let's see. Okay, uh, what uh, what other, just name one country in the history of the world that was successful with a weak central government. Okay, well that's asking the wrong question because the reality is that would be like during the abolitionist movement, say, give me one country that has been successful economically without slavery. Slavery was widespread at that point in time. But the fact is, the abolitionists said, we don't care if, it doesn't matter if every country on the planet has slavery, and that it is a, it's more efficient, it's this, that, or that, even though we know the opposite to be true now, that's actually more efficient to hire and pay people and, and have voluntary relationships when it comes to employment. 
However, they could have made the argument at the time that, well, there's no proof out there. Give me one. Get, prove to me that this would work. Well, that's still, again, that's asking the wrong question because that would be like saying, prove to me that the economy can survive without slavery. Doesn't matter. Slavery is immoral. It's wrong. You know, even if government, let's assume for a second that government was more efficient than, than voluntary exchange, that because of the edicts and everything, that somehow it was just more efficient. Would that still outweigh the fact that government is using force, the barrel of the gun against people's heads to make them do things and coerce them? That's not freedom. That's not liberty. That's not that's not what many liberals would agree with. I mean, many liberals, even though they like the social programs, wouldn't want someone coming, you know, at the barrel of the gun and saying, "Hey, look, uh, we're going to force you not to have an abortion, or we're going to force you to not swear in public, or we're going to force you to not smoke marijuana, or we're going to force you to do all these different social things, or not do different social things that many liberals would find tyrannical." So, if you if you support the entitlements. And you support that as being moral, but then you go back and you say, well, no, it's wrong to force somebody to do this. Well, then you're saying that it's not the force that you object to. It's not the idea of the central government forcing people and coercing people, which is which you object to. It's actually the fact that it's not the force being used in the way that you, you think it should be used, which again shows that the moral foundation on which you stand is not logical, it's irrational, and frankly, it turns your, every argument that you make into an immoral argument, because since your moral foundation isn't there, you, you actually are not advocating uh, morality, and if you, ha if you actually break down, if you take the edicts out of morality, because a lot of people think, well, morality, that means like an edict from God. If you take, right. if you take that out, and you look at basically universal preferable behavior between each society that ever existed you will see that in every society murder is wrong you know aggression against someone who's not aggressed against you is wrong these are things that are universally accepted the part of morality the point of morality is that something is universally accepted you know you can't say that well homosexuality is immoral how there have been societies that allowed gay marriage in the past. Right. So if, you, if you're making the argument that it's immoral because God said it's immoral, logically it's not immoral because for it to be moral, it, ha it would have to be universally accepted. And if you take the natural state of man, the natural state of man is to abhor murder, to abhor theft. Uh, you know, you can take a guy who's never been brought up in a Christian home and just, if he's got the logical foundations of, right and wrong, he's going to say, no, it's wrong for someone to steal something from me. He's not going to say, oh, gay people should be put to death. Yeah, I mean, he's not going to say things like that because it just it doesn't make sense logically to, to say those things. So I think that if when you make them, and, and that tripped Julian up last night because typically I make the argument that we typically make, right? It's less efficient, government can't, can't do it right, it's wrong, it's not, it's unconstitutional, it's X, Y, and Z. But when I hit him with a moral argument and presented it, because I've been studying some philosophy and stuff, and I presented it basically using some uh, some method of deductive reasoning and trying to basically make the moral argument and show how his points were logically contradictory, he couldn't say anything. He was right. like, well, wow, you gave, me, you gave me some things to think about. Because when you challenge the morality, a lot of people either get mad or if they're smart, they actually you know, take what you say to heart. And right. I, mean, he, 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 he can, I would just like to, because it, it didn't, I already agreed with, obviously we agree with each other on, on healthcare and whatnot, but the way you phrased it was really uh, eye opening to me as far as how to pose it to people who don't really want to even investigate the other part where we talk about efficiency and all that and want to deny the fact that government sucks and anything it basically does except for killing people. So the, the way you said it exactly was, is the right to health care moral? Is, is there a right to health care? And if there is, is that right moral? And then you followed it up with saying, is the right to self-ownership, meaning owning yourself and what you do on a daily basis with yourself, and property 
moral. And Julian, to both of those uh, points, said, yeah, well, yeah, the right to health there, – there is a right to health care. Or no, he didn't say there is one, but he says the right to health care, if there is one, is moral. And the right to self-ownership and property is moral. And then you said, uh, but they, they can't both be. It's impossible. You can't have the right to – you can't have a right to health insurance and call that a moral right. And then also believe that people have a right to self-ownership and to their own property. And uh, the reason you say that is because uh, since the right to health care requires mandating that somebody provide it, doctors, insurance uh, agencies, uh, hospitals, it undermines the morality of property rights. Because now you are forcing people to do something they might otherwise not want to do. So for one to say it is both moral to mandate health care, while at the same time saying it is moral to claim self-ownership and property ownership, is self-contradictory. And uh, that was very, uh, a very profound thing to say because uh, how do you have a right to something that is provided by somebody else that if they chose not to provide it or to pursue that interest any longer, you, that kill profession, them. you should be able to kill you, them. You wouldn't have. There wouldn't be such a thing, right? No, you can't. So if tomorrow, if tomorrow, all the doctors, uh, and all the hospitals, and all the health insurance agencies said we're done, we're not doing it anymore. Well, you have a right to health care. So who's going to provide it? So now, either A, you say, well, that's fine. You're a doctor. You don't have to do. It. You were a doctor. You don't have to be a doctor if you don't want to be. And you were a hospital, but you don't. You can be a library now if you want to be. You know the owners of the hospital, and you're a health insurance company. You can switch over to car insurance now if you want to, or you have to say no. Uh, people have to have health care, so we're gonna get soldiers with guns and make you do it because there's a right to health care, right? Yes. So, so that's really the crux of the problem. If you want to take all the other things out and not think about the bigger picture, you can, you can really. And I, that was a very elegant way you put it. You can really. Boil it down to morals. I cannot say it is moral for me to rape while at the same time saying it, it is immoral for me to rape. So uh, I, thought, I just thought that was a, a, an interesting way to put it and maybe a way that, like you say, people that aren't willing to, uh, to bash government, uh, even though they need to, can wrap their minds around why it's not really right. For you to have health care, at least not if you believe people own themselves and own no. what they do. And own yeah, well, and, and morality is a motivating factor. And this is something that's just been brought to my attention. I'd never really thought of it the same way. I've been listening to a lot of uh, Stefan Molyneux, who's more of an anarcho capitalist, you know, libertarian type guy that does a lot of philosophy stuff on the internet. And I've been listening to some of his podcasts, and I'm thinking to myself when he's when he's talking, and he bashes libertarians a lot. and it, it, Not necessarily the idea of libertarianism, but the idea of limited government. He said, when has government ever been limited? When have you been able to limit them and they actually stay limited? And then also, how successful has the libertarian movement been in just trying to see, seek policy prescriptions? You know, the Cato Institute and Reason, you know, the Reason Foundation... They, they suggest things and, and, and trying to use the mechanism of government to get things done, but government has, has, has expanded drastically. Despite the libertarian movement, you know, in every other sector, every other movement, and, and by their own uh, prescriptions of government of how, you know, government's inefficient, X, Y, and Z can show you how they failed at achieving the goals that they set forward. Well, if you judge the libertarian movement by the goals it sets forth, it has failed radically and so i think that we have to take a different tact and realize that look some people are not going to respond to the efficiency claims of government however if you look at what drives people to vote different ways it's typically morality and certain moral truths or lack thereof of moral truth sometimes it's moral falsehoods that they are believing in that are illogical and don't make sense and if you break it down to them some people are going to get very upset and very mad because you are challenging the moral foundation of their being. And if you have right. been taught something is moral since the time you are three years old and someone is now challenging that, 
it, it can make a lot of people very, very, very angry. But if you want to get to the root of the problem in society, it's the lack of logical morality that is there. And so, you know, the reality is with, with anything, and this, that's one of the same points he made about healthcare, his healthcare podcast he did back in 2006. You know, he said, he said, if you say that someone has a right to health care, well, what, what are the conditions of that right? Does that mean that I can go in and say, uh, doctor, I need health care? And he says, well, I'm busy with this other patient. Can you pull out a gun and say, no, I need health. I have a right to health care. I need it now. Or can you say, okay, we'll come back. What if the doctor says, well, I'm not going to treat you? Can you pull out a gun and force him to go ahead and treat you? Because obviously you have a right to that. So Right, just like just and the just for people that are thinking that's ridiculous. The converse is that no one would say it's ridiculous that if the government told you you cannot have free speech, you cannot bear arms, you cannot assemble any other rights granted to you in the Constitution that are actually granted there uh, that are enumerated, you would agree completely. Yes, if somebody tells you you cannot speak freely, you are free to shoot them in the face. You know, if the government says no, then you, that's what your right to bear arms is for. If, if the government comes and tells you no, you can't bear arms. And yes, you need to kill those people because they are suppressing your rights. They say, no, you, you don't have a right to be happy. You can kill them. So if you want to throw health care in there as a right, and it's just as important to the rest of these rights, then why can't you enforce that right at gunpoint? Yeah, and, and, and why can't you? And, and so that that's what I'm saying. When you break these things down that way, in fact, that the, uh, the one comment about that, that, that guy said to me about being selfish – and I'm actually going to see if I can pull up uh, where the uh, where the discussion went after that because I think it's profound of how people would typically react to such claims, basically. And uh, let me see if I can pull it up because it was right after the uh, the whole healthcare thing came uh, became an issue. So. After the whole idea of the, the, the selfishness, and this is going to take just a second, I said, uh, I basically said, you know, on Obamacare, I said, how does it drive the cost down? This is a question you can't seem to answer. If you don't drive the demand down for health care or the supply up, then the cost of health care fall. Doctors should uh, be paid whatever people are willing to pay them. The same with college professors. College costs are too high, blah, blah, blah. That was something else. Um, well, he had basically told me that my argument was weak. I said, it's not a weak argument. This guy's name is uh, Jeremiah. It's a strong one. It's a moral argument. It's not weak because I'm against those things because he had brought up roads and the common thing that liberals bring up. Like, if you're against force, then how can you justify the morality of taxing people forcibly to pay for roads and things like that? And I said, I said, I don't think the state should use force to extort money from others to educate my child either because he brought up education. What about educating your child? Right. And then after I brought – once he saw how strong my moral foundation was that I did not have contradictions in my ideas, he said, yawn, I thought so. That's that, that was the end of his comment, right? right. Because he was done. And so my next comment, which officially ended it, was, for that matter, I'm against the entire institution. The idea of an institution that has a monopoly on force with a tool of coercion backed by the barrel of a gun is not a free society. The idea that a petty right to vote means you have consented to such force is outlandish. And it really is. What if I vote against the incumbent every time? And he wins every time. I didn't consent to that person. So I'm basically living underneath the tyranny of the majority to impose their ideas upon me when if you believe in the idea of natural rights and that, and, and, the, and the, the founders experimented with some of this. And Thomas Jefferson was more radical because he said, look, we don't you can't you shouldn't even have a bill of rights because there's more rights than are even on here. Right. It right. shouldn't be violated against their inherent in society, their inherent rights of the individual. They're all negative rights where you, you can basically what Thomas Jefferson should have got at. And he didn't get to it because of the time he lived in. It wasn't widely talk, talked about was the idea of the non-aggression principle, that it's wrong to coerce anybody, that just because you go to a society or governmental level, the moral rules that apply to the individual doesn't all of a sudden change. You know, the moral rule that I can't come to you and say I'm going to steal your money because I have a better need for it. Well, that's theft. 
what's theft when the government does it? Just because there, you know, we have this big organizational structure around it doesn't change the moral facts. So some people, then that goes into the question of that people bring up, well, are you proposing anarchy? Well, anarchy is a loaded term because there's a lot of baggage that comes with that term. You know, you know, real anarchists always say real anarchists don't throw chairs through Starbucks windows, right? Because that's a violation right. of private property. You know, real anarchists actually believe in private property. They believe in the rights of the individual. You know, yeah, there are socialist anarchists that think we can all live in little hippie communes and be stinky together. You know, that real, you know, voluntarists don't believe in that. So it's not that I. I have an issue with the idea of governing or governance. What I have an issue with is the idea that someone should be granted, it would be like granting a huge corporation and a monopoly over the entire United States and then saying you have a monopoly to control everything, right? And use force to control it because you have the monopoly versus if you have a voluntary system where, look, if I don't like the, gov the governing body that's governing me, I'll just go to another governing body. You know, you have dispute re uh, resolution agency. So there are, or, you know, or I mean, or that's what the states were originally supposed to yeah, be. Yeah, the state, the states it, were as it, well. It's supposed, no. to, it's supposed to be a weak central government with strong state governments. So if you're in a state and you don't like what they're doing, if they're doing universal health care, or they say you got to pay 50% state income tax, or whatever the fuck it is, you can say no, fuck your state. I'm gonna go to this other state that has way better shit that aligns with what I believe in. So I'm going to go there and, and, you know, but no, we don't have that because we've given way too much power to the federal government. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's why I think Thomas Jefferson at the time said, we don't need to set up a central government at all. Uh, the constitution gives the federal government still too much power. And he's probably looking back at it. Thomas Jefferson was probably right because almost immediately after the constitution was passed, John Adams was passing the alien sedition acts. Thomas Jefferson and him were fighting over that. Everyone, you know, if you know history, you know about that whole debacle. But you know what states did? They rebelled against it. You know, the Kentucky Resolutions, they rebelled against uh, the, the encroachment through nullification. So I think that it's not enough for even states at this point in time, going back to Obamacare, to opt out. They need to nullify that law. They, sure. That law doesn't even exist. I'm not opting out because it doesn't exist. In this state, Obamacare is not even an option. It doesn't exist. Right, and, and that's that. That is, if a governor did that, it would, or a state legislature, or or a population as a whole, it, it would be radical and it would be awesome. But that is originally how the states were. They had such a strong identity. When you said you were a Pennsylvanian or a Virginian, or or uh, from Tennessee or any or any of that New Yorker, it meant a lot. It meant that you had a certain value behind that state you had a certain set of goals that went well went along with most people in that state you had a certain way of looking at things you know those virginians are bastards when it comes to this or right those floridians those floridians don't north carolinians the carolinians they don't like this or that yeah and and it was such a struggle for them to even get the 13 original colonies to ratify the constitution because of how different everybody was yeah and how independent all these different colonies were and so it, what 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 happened was, and the the fundamental problem with the United States right now is that the states are too beholden to the money granted to them, which mostly is printed debt money anyway, uh, by the government for projects and programs in those states. So if they could get away from that, become more self sufficient again, get off the government, the federal government teat, and say, "Screw you! I don't want your money anymore. We'll suffer through it. We're going to do our own thing," and realize that by doing that. By ignoring federal regulations on whatever industry that state likes to have, you know what I'm saying? Say, well, screw your federal regulations that cause me not to be able to be profitable. You're you're the you're the government. You have no interest in me as a state becoming profitable. We're gonna make our own money this way. So now your federal regulations, EPA regulations, whatever it is, no longer apply to me because I'm a state and I'm autonomous from you. Right. Uh, and you have oh you have a you have a Obamacare. Well, no, you don't. It doesn't apply to me because I say it doesn't apply to me because I'm autonomous. And if you want to push the issue, I'll secede from the union because every state has that right. But no one will do that. But that is the exact way the United States was set up. And if you dispute that, you're an idiot. Yeah, no, that's exactly the way it was set up. And I would argue that it's not only gone in the op opposite direction. It's even if it had stayed the way that it was uh, originally intended, 
it would still be somewhat of a problem because states are so popular, much more populated now than they used to be. So when you look at the politician to citizen ratio, it is so much for every politician. There's way more citizens than there used to be. So it was, it was, it, yeah, if 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 you that's that makes things more tyrannical because if you look at North Carolina back then, their representatives truly represented the will of that community. And so it was more of a community government that was voluntary to some degree. And so, you you know, very rarely would you be in that, that type of situation where you didn't agree with a lot of the policies. And if you happen to be the one or two people that thought that it was nonsense, you just move and go somewhere else, right? So, but I, th I think, and people have proposed this as well, that the, the land mass of the United States is just too big for a country to have. And that should really have been... You know, probably would have been a better thing in the long run. It would have been. We talked about this a second ago on Facebook, but in the short run, it would have been bad for the slaves. But in the long run, splitting the United States up between the United States and the Confederate States probably would have been better off. As far as from, you'd have two central governments there. You'd have states with smaller populations, and ultimately, government closer to the people because you 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 basically broke that federal apparatus up. Right. Well, not 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 even not even going that far. Uh, maintain your weak central government and and make sure it re it retain it remains weak by not allow not allowing yourself as a state to take federal money for anything. You know that you know because then you're you're in their pocket basically, and keep retain your identity and your power. But you make the laws for your own state, and so state. Legislatures are way more representative, representative of their population because each parish has so many people that go to the state legislature. Well, I'm speaking through Louisiana. If you're not from Louisiana, county right. has you know a certain amount of people, which is way more representative of that. It could be better. It could be more people now. Just like Congress, if you actually were going to keep the ratio the same as it started out, Congress would be a huge. <laughs> the population of Congress would be ridiculous. Yeah. Or, because you have you have you have some people that re that represent so many other people, but keep the states powerful, and most of the laws made are in state laws. So Louisiana may say, if you live in Louisiana, you're gonna pay this tax, and it's gonna pay for everybody's health care. Yeah, and you may say, fuck that, I don't want to do that. So guess what I'm gonna do? I'm moving to Texas, and Texas may say, we don't want to do that, and you go great, I like Texas now, and now you're a Texan. And that is how it was originally supposed to be. Yeah. Not, oh, the federal government is going to pass overreachingly huge, gigantic laws that affect every state, and you can't escape them. That's not how it was supposed to be. No, it, it wasn't. And if you look at, you know, another thing that could happen, which I think would be a a interesting thing to propose, and, and possibly should have been proposed initially, was that let's say you have a large state. Let's take um, – what's a large state? Texas. Texas. I don't think this would happen in Texas, but let's just look at Texas because it's a, it's a large state. Let's say you have North Texas that has – because the population has grown so large in the, in the state, North, the ideals of North Texas is so fundamentally different from South Texas. But South Texas has more of a majority. So because South Texas has more of a majority, South Texas is actually is able to impose upon North Texas. North Texas decides, you know what, we want to break away from the state of Texas, set up Texas North, kind of like North Carolina, South Carolina, and do North Texas, South Texas. And we want the, the, the weak central government to recognize our new constitution as North Texas. Having the ability to do that would be able to – what would end up happening, I think, is you'd still have that weak central government, but you would have way more states. States would be much more representative of the community. So instead of having 50 states, we'd have 100 states, and all the states would be so much smaller and more representative of the people that you know in, in their particular community. So if one state becomes tyrannical, that's, you know, that's part of the, the argument that some liberals have made. Like, well, what happens if a state becomes tyrannical? That means we need a strong central government. No, you don't defect to a larger, you know what I'm saying? You don't make them more powerful to be able to infringe upon your right. rights then. What you do is, is you empower the people who are in areas that are being oppressed by the larger state government to break away from the state and set up their own state, right? Sure. I, I think it's, that would have been a good idea. 
I, I think that's an awesome idea. I think I don't know why that wouldn't be a good idea. And I would ask people who think that's crazy. Oh, that's insane. You can't have states do that. There's only 50 states. Then really, so it's it's crazy for people not to be ruled by mob rule. So let's take Louisiana, for example. South Louisiana is much, much more populated than North Louisiana. North Louisiana, you have Shreveport and Monroe, basically. South Louisiana, you have Baton Rouge, Lake Charles, uh, Lafayette, uh, New Orleans, right? Most people live in South Louisiana, period. Uh, so you think it's okay for when something is voted on in, in Louisiana that the majority of the time the people in the South make the decisions, the people in the North live with it. Well, no. You, just like you would say, if I live in a two-story house – and there's four people that live downstairs, two people live upstairs, and the people downstairs always vote together. Is that fair that you live upstairs and you have to abide by the rules people that live downstairs just because there's four of them down there? No. You would say, well, look, we'll have our own rules upstairs, and you have your own rules downstairs. And when we come to your downstairs, we'll abide by your rules while we're in your downstairs, in your downstairs area. But if you come up to the upstairs, you have to, you have to abide by our rules because you're in our upstairs area. Well, how is that not fair? So yeah, I totally agree with that. I think I think that's an awesome idea, and I think that's something maybe we missed. You know, the founders could think of everything they thought of so much, and when you think about all the things they did and thought about, yeah, past wanting to call them bigots and slave slave lovers and all that, which is ridiculous if you really, know the yeah. History. But just it's amazing that they did what they did, but they couldn't get everything. No, I think that's a no. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, and I think that, and I think that they never. I think that, I think their fault was. If, you, if it's anything, they misjudge the scope by which America would be successful well, and by how large it would grow. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't. A lot of them didn't even realize, like you know, Thomas Jefferson thought that we'd be lucky if it if, it, if the republic lasted twenty years. I mean, he just right. didn't. Right, and and but also because the spirit of revolution and liberty was so strong then. Yeah, he saw. I'm sure, I know he did. He wrote about it. He saw, as did Patrick Henry and many others. This thing is so radical and so free thinking, and so so every man takes care of him, himself and his fellow man if he wishes. That the minute that that big government came along, there would be bloodshed again yeah. and it would reset. That didn't happen because people, without the right leaders and the right, you know, there's yeah. a time and a place for revolution, and, and it didn't happen because people were too prosperous. Yeah, they 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 got they got focused on their money and not focused on their liberty. Yeah, and so yeah. Well, they let it. They let, well, I, they let I, corporations I, I, and, and government. Stuff like that, take it over. Yeah, I would say that that to an extent, it ended up di- it did end up happening with the Civil War, though, because you had sure, you, you're right. You had you're right. You, you and I think Jefferson almost predicted that to a T. I mean, he was like, it might last a hundred years, and and very close to the hundred year mark, that was when you know things went crazy with the Civil War, and and really that was because of the central government playing with tariffs, and that was the real reason why it started. So. You take the slavery issue out of it. If you just look at why it started, what were the real issues that the southern population had with the northern population? It was more or less the fact that the northern population was heavy, you know, more populated. Therefore, they were imposing on the South through certain uh, uh, privileges that the federal government had that had been given to them by the Constitution as far as regulating trade and tariffs. You know, basically. They were putting tariffs on things that would end up hurting the South and helping the North, and they were doing right. It, well, yeah, it, yeah, it's exactly right. And the fact that the the slave, I mean, slavery does enter into it, but it's more of an economic thing. It's not. Yeah. It's not really. It's not really at the time. It, for some, it was, but for for the South, at least, it wasn't a we hate black people thing. It was a the North is more populous with free people, and the the government, the central government, grants them more privileges on producing what they produce. And they punish us for what we produce with slave labor, which is cheaper. So to keep the North competitive with the South, we're going to pass tariffs and taxes on the things the South produces to make them more expensive. So even the playing field, which is not the some government's supposed to fucking do, it's not fair. Yeah. So the South became enraged and said, "That's ridiculous." The North said, "No, it's not ridiculous," and that's when they broke away. Which, if you want to be constitutional about it, they have the right to. Yeah. The South should have been, yeah. if you want to go by the Constitution, allowed to say. Goodbye to the union. Yeah. And, we do our own thing. And, and the reality is, I think that if you look at just from a production standpoint, the slavery might have lasted longer, but no, I think it definitely yeah. would have lasted longer. But definitely, but, definitely. But as soon as the cotton gin came out, I mean, 
they wouldn't have been able to compete with that. I mean, whenever uh, you'd have one farmer that'd say, you know what, I'm going to try this whole cotton gin thing and just sell my slaves off. And then he would just outcompete everybody and just murder them. And well, you're right, but you're, you're, out you're it. right. If, if eventually technology would have, would have out, yeah. uh, outperformed but, manpower, but, but you still would have the vestiges of slavery yeah. in, in, the, in, in the home with people that are house servants, stuff like that. And that, and that would have gone on for a long time. And I'm not saying that one or the other is, is a good trade-off, but it's a, it's a valid point to make that if you want to go by the Constitution, if you want to have the Supreme Court rule on something and say it's constitutional, you they couldn't rule other than the fact that the South should be able to secede from the Union. Yeah. If, if, if you would have put that in front of a Supreme Court that, that – yeah legitimately knows the constitution they, it's it's in black and white the well, constitution they, they have to write they them, actually so. probably should have demanded it you know you know what i'm saying like if you look at uh in the spirit of the constitution the the federal government should have said look the, the values that you represent in the south because it's so abhorrent with slavery against the constitution you cannot be part of this union any longer you can either end slavery or you can break away and start your own country. Yeah, you have these two options. Yeah, because because we cannot have you underneath our central umbrella, basically. And the, and one of the things many people miss, and now we're getting off the top of the healthcare a little bit, yeah. but this goes back. We to always the founding do this shit. <laughs> which <laughs> which goes back to the founding fathers, and, and if people want to disparage them and say that they didn't know what they were doing, uh, and people always say, well, why didn't we just get rid of slavery at the founding of the country? What well, you know? That why were uh, why were the founding fathers, some of them, slave owners? And, and Well, it's not that simple. You have a nation who was built on the back of slave labor. So if you want to form a union and fight off the British and, and become you know, more, more than just 13 colonies, you have to unify. And you can't unify by saying to the, the, the colonies that use slave labor extensively and rely on it for their, uh, for their, livelihood, for their livelihood. No, if you want to become part of this – you can't have slavery. You're never going to have a union. You're never going to have the power and the people to fight off the British. So if you want not to have slavery, the founding of the country, you don't have the United States of America. It wouldn't happen. End of story. Research it. Yep. If you don't, if you believe anything else, you're an idiot and you're uneducated because that is the legitimacy of it. Mm -hmm. And there's many writings by many of the founding fathers saying it is abhorrent to us that slavery exists. It is not the natural state of man. You, you must admit. But the, the nation wasn't ready for getting rid of slavery. And every founding father that had a slave, th those weren't slaves. They didn't treat those people as slaves, and they emancipated a lot of them. They treated them as family members for the most part. But they knew that they knew if if I become a teetotaling non-slave owner, I'm going to lose a, uh, account or lose a rapport with my southern uh, people that I have to deal with, the other the other politicians and whatnot. And I'm not going to be able to influence them to become part of the union that we yeah. need to fight with the British and form this country. So before you go and jump off the deep end and say that the, the you know the founding fathers didn't know weren't all these great men we thought they were, they were they were amazing. They were geniuses. And of course they were men and they were flawed, but they were less flawed than you think they were, because they thought way ahead to the fact that one day. The country will be ready and awakening and ready to get rid of slavery. But right now, if we if we push this issue, there won't be yeah. a country. Yeah, we'd all be speaking with British accents right now. Yeah, and, and and you know, like I said, it was just unheard of at the time. And you know, that goes back to my point. You know, it's unheard of at the time now to say that is the moral foundations of a government that has a central government that has a monopoly on force is that you know immoral? I mean, it's a legitimate question to ask. And so some people are like, no, it's government. We voted for it. We? We we do not exist. The only thing that exists is the individual. Chris, you exist. I exist. We together do not make up an entity that actually exists physically in this world. Right. The only thing that exists is why people are like, there's a, a very strong argument, and some people would get incredibly offended by it when it comes to war. To suggest that if you go to war voluntarily, unless you're coerced, obviously, by the government, if you go to war voluntarily and you kill people that are not threatening you because the government says kill them, you are a murderer. And that sounds harsh because people are like, well, they're defending our country. They're defending our freedoms. But if you look at the moral truths, 
if you voluntarily go and you kill someone because your government says they are a threat, even though they're not threatening you or your family, or, or even if they invade this country and you go and you kill them because they're invading, that would be you know, part of self-defense. But if you go and you invade another country and then you kill people because the government says that they might be a terrorist, if you're operating a drone and you drop it on a wedding that kills and you have all this collateral damage, I'm sorry, you're a murderer. I mean, there's no other way to put that. You know? Yeah, you're, you're right. And if you start to capitulate to that and you start to say, well, you know, start to make all these exceptions and stuff, then it's not a moral law. Murder is okay if the government says it's okay. You know, and, and, and that's not how moral laws are set up. Moral laws are absolute because they are universally applied. It is absolute that I cannot, I should not be able to go to your face right now and, and, and shoot you in the face. Okay, it's just, no one would disagree with that. But all of a sudden when you say, well, when you talk about society as a whole, these moral laws are a little bit too restrictive. We need to be able to do things for right. the greater if, good, you know, all this collectivist sure. shit. Right, right. You shouldn't be able to kill people. But if that country uh, in the past has per- perhaps or perhaps not, it's debatable, funded terrorism against us, uh, or if that country uh, likes to control a resource that we like to have uh, in a way that we don't like, then it is okay to uh, do uh, cyber terrorism against that country, to sanction that country, which causes people to die in the country because they can't get things they need, and to talk about and eventually bomb and kill people within that country. Yeah. Uh, but it, it is immoral to kill people. Um, murder them when they don't pose a threat to you. Yeah. And that is the story of Iran. So, and Afghanistan, and Iraq. So, um, yep. And what, what's funny to me is people think that all these things are new, that the founding fathers never intend, you know, never had to deal with terrorism. Well, again, you don't know history. There was these guys called the Barbary Pirates, who, uh, <laughs> they were Muslims, and they took the Muslim teachings to the extreme. And uh, they basically were the same thing to America as, uh, what, what is it, the, the jihad, the, yeah. the terrorists. That, they, they, that we have. In fact, they were exactly the same. Exactly the same, and they they used the same excuse that, and they and they attacked us. And uh, the temptation there was for us to go blow them out of the water, but the founding fathers didn't do that. They realized that we have, you know, they had to realize that. We need to back away from the things that we uh, we influence, not create blowback on ourselves, and not get into wars that we can't in the end really win and kill people that had no nothing to do with it. Yeah, and that's I mean, how we got out of that situation. It's like it's like people are like whenever you bring up uh, these issues with terrorism, they go back to um, well the Barbary p- pirates. Well, we didn't invade a single country to deal with the bar- the Barbary p- pirates, right? But basically, what Thomas Jefferson ended up doing is. The trade ships, he just sent the Navy to ride alongside it to defend the trade ships. And when the trade ships were attacked, they just defended the trade ship. That's 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 the whole story behind that, right? right. That's not invading a country, right? And, so, and that's not killing people who have not aggressed against you either. And so, yeah, I mean, this whole, this whole idea, and that's what Marquee and Reprisal was for in the Constitution. If you look at the Constitution, it's, it's you know, and, and uh, Ron Paul introduced this with the Air Piracy Act. He considered the terrorism that took place to be air piracy, which is what it is. And he said we need to put a, mar- a marquee and reprisal on bin Laden's head and all of these different terrorists that, that, that had to do with it. And then basically let Blackwater, a private, private individuals, go take him out and we'll pay them. But you didn't have a standing army and all this nonsense. And the federal government could really imply, you know, have plausible deniability because they were like look you attacked us we put a bounty on your head and we said hey whatever but the reality was we would have got bin laden probably within a year (laughs) you know which probably died within a year anyway and then obama brought out some propaganda to try to help his poll numbers by saying that you know there was some raid in pakistan and all this other nonsense and he was sitting in the war room conducting the raid and he's a hero and all this nonsense ridiculousness and yeah it, it just 
it astounds me that you know people people believe everything this government says without questioning one thing. Like, how do I know they killed Bin Laden just because they said so? I mean, when you've got you know past black op commanders that are like, no, my 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 intelligence sources in the CIA said that he died in 2002, and they were just waiting for a political opportunity to say, look, we got Bin Laden because they knew they wouldn't have to show the American people any proof because the American people just will buy anything. I mean, you just tell them. Just say, uh, aliens invaded yesterday. Um, we know you might not have seen it, but the aliens did invade. They took over major cities. We thwarted them and sent them back into outer space. You have nothing to worry about. And people will be like, oh my God, aliens were here. Uh, they, I live in that city, but I didn't see them. But, well, we're the government. We say that they were here, so... What are you going to do? Oh, well, I guess they were here. They were here because you said they were. I mean, you're going to need to show me some proof. They didn't show me any proof. They just, just Obama got on TV and said, we got Bin Laden. And that was it. Okay. Right. I mean, so, you know. Well, the course, the course the argument with that is we should trust uh, government. And if they revealed that, it would make people incensed and they would be. We, we can't handle the picture of a dead body, but they show us pictures of dead bodies that we bomb oh, yeah. all the time. Look, and you know, they show us Gaddafi, and they showed it. You know, you could go watch a video that had been pirated of of them hanging um, uh, Saddam. Uh, Saddam Hussein. Yeah, and uh, we can have movies with nothing but violence in them. But when it comes to them showing the dead, oh, you know, you saw dead Gaddafi, when you, but when you see, they want to show you the dead body of <laughs> enemy number one of the state. No, we can't show you that. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm not. And I'm not. I'm not saying that we didn't kill Obama. I'm sure we did. But the point is. Yeah, who? I'm sorry, Osama. <laughs> so I just made a Greta Van Susteren. Uh, yeah, you made a Greta Van Susteren uh, thing. Yeah, I mean, my whole thing is, is at this point in time, I literally trust nothing they say. They they have to show me proof at this point in time because. What what is my thing is what is the deterrent against it? Why do they not show you proof? Really. Like, why can't we see that? You know, and and, and when you it blows my it blows my mind that we are as a country. The same people that say we can't let people die in the streets, we can't let people walk, you know, not get medical care. We can't let this happen. Are the same people that on their drive to work, listen to CNN, Fox News, uh, ES, not ESPN, <laughs> that's sports, uh, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, whatever. And they hear that we dropped a bomb mistakenly uh, on a building and killed 15 children and seven women and three guys. That had nothing to do with what we wanted to do. We weren't terrorists. We are just living their lives. We killed them. They're dead. There's a mistaken intelligence in a country that is sovereign to itself, can protect itself, or should be able to protect itself as a, as a right. And they hear that news. We dropped the bomb and it killed children women and men that are innocent. We keep driving to work. We don't think about it. We don't go, that's fucking horrible. What the fuck? And we hear that our general uh, in that area is apologizing and promising an investigation. There's no outrage from him. There's no, there's no uh, understanding and there's no, there's no seeking to really reevaluate while we're there. And that person just drives to work and the when they get to work, the first thing they talk to their coworkers about isn't, did you hear about the bomb that we dropped and fucking killed 15 people that are innocent, had nothing to do with anything? The first thing out of their mouth is, man, I wonder what the Supreme Court's going to rule. Or, did you watch Dancing with the Stars last night? I can't believe they cut that guy. Did you watch American Idol? So if you want to talk about compassion in America, you need to get your fucking morals straight. Because that is not moral to drop a bomb on another country and kill innocent people. With horrible intelligence. Yeah. You're trying to kill people that are questionably that we should even have a right to go find and kill anyway. Because they might be plotting terrorist acts against us. Yeah. So America needs to wake up and realize that you're not moral. You're lazy. Yeah. And you're 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 fooling yourself when you say we need to take care of people and, and be compassionate. Yeah. Well how compassionate are are you in your mind as a human yeah. being? To that family just lost their children, yeah. that 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 father who lost his sons, that mother who died, yeah. the grandmother who the whole family is wiped out. She had, her whole legacy is dead because we dropped the bomb on that house. And you go to work and you talk about American Idol, 
Give me a fucking break. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's just about you're rationalizing it because you don't want to think that you're not a moral person. But the reality is, is there's nothing moral, there's nothing virtuous about stealing other people's money to be charitable with it. There's nothing moral about dropping bombs on people that didn't that didn't do anything to you. So you can rationalize that type of stuff all day long. But I think that it, it goes back not only to the moral argument, but it goes back to uh, what Albert J. Knox said in Our Enemy of the State, which was – Anytime the government takes more power, it where does it get that power? It gets it from society as a whole. So if 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 the moral ob- obligations of society continue to be taken on by the government, the society will be less and less moral because of it. They're being robbed of their social duty and their social power to help each other and do things that they should do for one another just because people have empathy and want to help someone, right? So, you know, it's just a, 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 a robbing of, uh, of social power by the government. So, um, Chris, I'm going to give you the last point. We need to go ahead and wrap this thing up. We, uh, we went over just a tad bit like we typically do, but go ahead and uh, finish up. Uh, the, the, the final thing I want anybody to listen to this to say is just evaluate what you believe in on a daily basis and, and why you believe it. Are we a compassionate nation? Do we do unto others as we to have them do unto us? If we weren't the most powerful military in the world and no one could really impose their will upon us, which may change, what, you know, and, and other countries did to us what we do to them, would we stand for it? Would we think it's okay for people in our country to be bombed uh, that another country thought were terrorists? Would we be all right with that? Would we... Be all right with people taking money personally out of our pockets and spending it on our neighbor uh, without our choice to do so. Uh, What are our morals and what is moral and what isn't moral? We need to think about these things because, uh, like I said on Facebook and and Chad saw uh, the status, I'm sure, my theory more and more is that liberty is not for the many. Uh, it can't be maintained the more people you have because you have a certain type of person who doesn't understand liberty and operates from false pretenses or out of good intentions that really are destructive in the end. And the more people you have, the more chances you have that those there will be more of that type of person. And eventually that type of person will get power and eventually they will change your society. So my thesis is that you – have to have a smaller population to maintain liberty, and so that maybe that maybe that is a state, maybe that is a city, maybe that is a town. I don't know, but just as an American on a daily basis, think about these things and think about how they really should impact you and how desensitized you are to the notion of losing your liberty or other people losing their lives. Well said, sir. And uh, and you know, in my closing statement, basically. It all goes back to morality. It goes back to logical morality, and the reality is that if you, if the reality is that if you reject reality, not, the reality is that if you uh, reject sort of the logical reasoning behind uh, morality, if the, if the if the moral principles are logical in themselves, then you have to reject logic. Right, I mean, you can't even use words because words require require understanding, reasoning, and logic. So you can't reject that. Logical facts are facts because, again, they can be they can be proved proven through either deductive reasoning or some you know sort of philosophical manner, but they are facts as far as the the way that man, mankind thinks about certain principles. And if you're trying to prove moral truths, that's the way that you have to prove it. Um, going forward, I would say definitely that the liberty movement needs to sh- try to shift to that. We've done a great job of e- uh, educating people. Ron Paul has done an excellent job of educating people. But I think that if we can start to make these moral arguments more clear, and even if people don't always agree with the solutions that we bring up, if we can just get them to think about the moral argument, the moral argument against the state in general, then they can most likely come to some sort of understanding that, number one, the state's immoral, so either we need to try to limit that drastically, or you know, get uh, get rid of the strong central government, or if you're going to have it, have it much weaker, or have stronger state government. Whatever their solution is, it's going to be ten times better than what we're currently able to achieve by not by not addressing the current moral argument. 
Uh, also, in closing, on the description of this YouTube video, check out libertyclassroom.com. There's a link there and support not only uh, Liberty Classroom, but also support this podcast. It helps fund this podcast. And then also thank Chris for coming on again and talking about the healthcare situation. And uh, next week, I know it's in the news right now. We didn't get time to talk about it, but I will talk about it next week when I do the podcast because I'm sure new uh, news will be, be out on it, which is Eric Holder being held in contempt by Congress. And uh, it's an interesting uh, debacle in itself. I'm sure the Justice Department will not prosecute him because he's an insider, traitor, evil son of a bitch. And so uh, other than that, that's all I have for this week's edition of the Libertopian Podcast. And uh, see you guys next week. Later.